be kept. I mean, it's, it's very temporary. It's going to die. It's going to rot. It's going to perish. And that's just the way it is. And so you may have a, some kind of a high or some kind of a health for a while when you drink. You get your mind off of something, perhaps, whatever that might be. But that's going to go away. And it's going to go away by the next day. You're going to be hung over, and then you're going to be starting to remember exactly why you drank in the first place. And, and yeah, you'll be, you'll be depressed, basically. And that's what, it, that's what leads to that. So debauchery is the reality that it's going to lead to destruction. And not because it just, you know, it's about destruction. It has no choice but to be led to destruction. It just simply cannot be saved. It is as temporary as temporary gets. It has to be destroyed. It just simply does. And so that's why we do not drink, according to this verse. But we, be, we are filled with the Spirit. Now, we have to look at these verbs, too. And that's a lot of the verbs that we talk about in this passage of Scripture. They're, um, they're participles. You know, we act on them, that kind of thing. And, uh, they're, they're, they're not really, they don't really come out as very important. Both of these verbs, be not drunk and be filled, are imperative. Now, in Greek, the imperative is a commanding type of a verb. When, when there's something that's an imperative in there, when, when, when the Lord adds an imperative, or the writer of the Bible adds an imperative, boy, they're adding something that, boy, you need to do that. Yes, yeah, command right there. So, be not drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. But not only are they imperatives, they're also passive, not active. Now, when there's an active verb, it means that we got to do something with that. But when it's passive, it means something is being done on our behalf. So be not drunk with wine. What's being done on our behalf? Well, as we drink the wine or the alcohol and we get, you know, we get you know, drunk and all that, it's the wine, it's the alcohol itself that's affecting us. It's the alcohol itself that's, that's, that's acting on our behalf. And, uh, and really, it's acting toward your destruction, not toward your benefit. But when we're filled with the Spirit, it's the Spirit that acts on our behalf. So it's, it's something that is done on our behalf. We talk about our faith in Christ being an act of faith, and it needs to be an act of faith. But it's got to start with something passive. It's got to start on a foundation that has nothing to do with you. It's got to start on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, buried, risen again, ascended, and soon and very soon coming down. It's got to be, and to, to bring us up to bring us up to heaven. It's got to be on top of that foundation, that solid foundation of Christ alone. It has nothing to do with us whatsoever. We just simply have to be the benefit of that. If we don't have a faith that is grounded in that passive work, in that work that to us is passive, to Christ is very active, we have no faith. It's not grounded on that active work of Christ. We have no faith. Salvation, justification has nothing to do with you. If it had something to do with you, you wouldn't be saved. Because you can't save yourself. And that's true of all of us. So as I point to you, I'm pointing back at me too. Thankfully, I do not have to rely on myself for salvation. Thankfully. Okay. Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The red didn't come out nearly as well as I was hoping to. But that word is daily. The idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not something that happens once. It, the reality of the possibility of being filled with the Holy Spirit happens once. It's called regeneration. That happens in the process of salvation, justification. We are regenerated. The Holy Spirit gives us new life. New ability, we are a new new creature, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5 17. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. So, but when we come to say we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need to be seeking the will of God, understanding what the will of God is. This is not just something that just happens automatically. We've got to work at it. And it's got to be working out that salvation with fear and trembling. It's that same concept. So we deny ourselves. If anyone wants to come after Christ, let them deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is something we need to come every morning to do. We, do, we need to do that. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, uh, if you ever heard of him, He's, uh, he had a radio show back in the 60s, 70s, that kind of thing. Uh, it was before my time, but I have his books. I've got to read those and they've been very helpful over the years. And... Um, 
And he says it in this way. It got me filled with the Holy Spirit. It's about as easy as, go, as driving up to the filling station and asking the guy running the filling station, fill me up. It's as easy as doing that. Now, it's difficult to do nowadays because we don't have full service fueling stations. We've got to do it ourselves. But if you can, you know, pretend that we did it, it's as easy as that. It's as easy as just asking that kind of thing. I like, I like that uh, example that he gave. It's as easy as doing that. But it, it requires coming to him. It requires coming to him in prayer. It requires saying, Lord, give me your spirit today. Fill me with your spirit so I may do your will. So I may, I may, I may know what you're pleasing and perfect acceptable will is for this very day and age. Send me to someone to present your gospel to, because that is your will. It's a great commission, it's part of his will. And so, you know, these are some things, things we have to do every day. Not to confess, do I do that every day? No, I don't. I don't. Thankfully, I do it more often than I used to. But I don't do that every day. And, and, and it's, easy, it's easy to say, much easier, much harder to do. I mean, even if I did get up at 5.30 in the morning and say, fill me with your spirit, Lord, and at 6 o'clock I'm doing something else, you know, that's easy to say. It's a whole lot harder to do. And so we need to learn to be diligent in doing that, discipline ourselves to be able to do that kind of thing. Acts 2 is an example of when the church was filled with the Holy Spirit. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. As you read this, you don't see this is something that they had to do. It was a must, like the government was making them do that. This is not communism. What this is, is the idea that when somebody had a need, they would help them. What they had wasn't really theirs to begin with. It was what God gave them as stewards. And when someone had a, a real need, now I'm talking about a real need, not one of those fake needs, like I don't want to work with But if they had a real need, they would actually sell stuff and so they could meet that need for them. And that, what, what a great way to show <coughs> that. Now you can say all you want to all kinds of people, your neighbors, your friends, your family, the person sitting next to you, I love you. But if you don't show them you love them, how do they know? I mean, words are so simple to say. But the actions are what define those words. This is a church that loved each other. They had these things in common. They came together realizing that there wasn't one better than the other. They have all things in common. And that takes me to this next verse where I jump together, jump ahead. James 2, 1, my brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If you follow along further in James chapter 2, you're going to find that, that the writer is, is telling this church that if you bring, if you see people coming into your fellowship and you say to that rich guy that's coming in, oh, oh, come sit at this wonderful place. This place of prominence. And, and then there's this poor guy and tatters coming in. You're like, um, well, you go stand over there. Or uh, well, how about you just come and sit at my feet like you're a dog? You know, is that showing partiality? I'd say it would be. Certainly. So so he was, you know, James, the apostle James, or uh, the brother of Jesus, was basically saying that please do not show partiality. As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, showing partiality is no different than getting drunk. It's completely inconsistent with the Christian life and not what a Christian needs to be doing. We need to be sharing with one another. We need to be having all things in common. And that's part of being filled with the Spirit. And so we need to be models of wisdom. And we need to be filled with the Spirit. So... The next need that we're looking at, we're asking this question, what changes must we allow the Spirit to make in our lives in order, in order to serve the way God wants? And that next need, we need to be true worshipers. Like I said earlier, when you truly serve the Lord, the end of that is worship. 
Now we know the ultimate end of that is worship, obviously, because that's what we're going to do in heaven. But I think it even goes even before that point. The reality is we need to be coming together and worshiping together. Understanding that we're not worshiping as an exercise or just something we do because, well, that's what we've always done. But we come together full of the Spirit, understanding that we have served each other, we have served our community throughout the week. And we come together in praise, in thankfulness, and in glory to God for giving us salvation, for giving us new life in Him, for giving us His Spirit, and for giving us the ability to do that work. By gifting us, by giving us the abilities that we need to do that work of serving one another. That's why we need to be here. So, verses 5, or, uh, verses 19 through 21 in chapter 5 is just simply what being filled with the Spirit looks like at this point. And we can go even further than this. This is what these three verses address. Five different verbs going on here. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. It didn't say singing to one another in psalms and spiritual psalms. That's the next point. Whether you're singing the psalms or you're addressing each other with these things. We need to understand this. Uh, before you know, preaching begins on Sunday morning and evening, we sing. And we don't sing because it's just an exercise or something to do. It's, you know, some people teach that you know, the audience is not very active in worship service. And that's opportunity for them to be active because, yeah, you're sitting here watching me preach. Um, not, not a whole lot of activity there, although I hope you're learning. But so we, we're being active. That's helpful. That's very secondary to what the real reason is that we sing to one another. We sing to one another because that helps us to grow. That's why it's important, the songs that you sing. That's why it's important for them to be sound. For them to be real. I mean, I, I've been in services before, not as a music minister, sometimes as a music minister, too, I have to admit. Um, that the song is, I love you, Lord. How I love you, Lord. You know what? There's some weeks, that's a great song to sing. But other weeks, I just don't feel like singing that. If it's really dependent on me, there's just some weeks I don't have the strength, or I don't even have the care to try to give my emotion to that. But when I come in and I sing a song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing to My Heart to Sing Thy Grace. Amen. Now I'm not talking about just older songs. Blessed be your name in the land that's plentiful and the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place or I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. What does that say? No matter what happens in life, may the name of the Lord be praised. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Amen. You know, when I sing those songs, it's not about me. But those songs teach me something so great that takes me into the week. That gives me the ability, that gives me the care to even go to God every day and say, fill me with your spirit. Amen. So those I love you, I need you type songs, they're helpful. But boy, you've got to be in the right mindset. So yeah, we may sing those songs, but first we're going to sing, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, something that we can sing and it doesn't really matter what we feel like, it's going to get us in the mood. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's not the reason I chose this song, but uh, I'll tell you this, A Mighty Fortress, you look at what's happening in the news, you look at ISIS, and you look at uh, the fact that they are doing some horrible things in Iraq. Horrible things. Brother David wrote a blog. It's very good. You need to read that. It's on our church website. But um, what can we do to help? And it's just a terrible thing that happens. But you hear a song, and though this world with the devil's 
filled, should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can't endure. For lo, his doom is sure. There's going to be a time when Satan is going to end. When Satan's going to be over. His power will have nothing on this world. It'll be Christ who wins. We know the end. We know the victory. The victory is in Jesus Christ. He is our Savior forever. And he gave glory to him for that. Satan is defeated. Praise the Lord for that. I'll tell you this morning, I got up at 5 in the morning and I, 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 put, I set my alarm at 5 30 and woke up anyway at 5. And I got to business with this message and, and uh, I'm barely standing up right now. Didn't have a lot of sleep last night. So I love God need you type song. It's not going to work today. So thankfully, God knew that and said those songs. So there can be power. There can be edification. Thankfully. I've gone way too far on that. Didn't need to go so far with that. But we'll do it anyway. Colossians 3.16. This is uh, Ephesians and Colossians are very similar uh, books. If you ever read those two back to back, you're going to find a lot of similarities between the two. And it's a wonderful thing to read. Uh, Ephesus and Colossians, if you look on the map, they're about you know, 20, 30 miles apart from each other. Um, now, that was a long way back in that day, but uh, they're not too far from each other, both Asian minor. And so, Paul says a lot of the same things to, to these two churches. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your heart to God. See, we address, we sing, and then we make melody in our hearts. Who are we addressing? We're addressing each other. When we come together and sing, we're singing to one another. When we sing,